Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray in Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in Conversation With on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. Great to be able to catch up with you once again. And, you know, it's quite amazing, maybe shocking to some that this is the first federal budget that we've received from the federal government in two years. Um, I want to talk about that in terms of whether or not that should shock anybody. But uh, I do want to get your reaction from a uh, taxpayers association perspective. And in your most recent report, you're calling this uh, a fiscal inferno. Um, it, that sounds very dramatic, is it? Well, the amount of money spending in here is quite dramatic. So I think it's appropriate. Uh, you know, hang on to your wallets because the deficits we're looking at in this budget are unprecedented. Uh, remarkably, they have nothing to do with the pandemic. I mean, everybody understands we're in the middle of a crisis and there had to be a whole bunch of money to sort of tide us over. But what's interesting about this budget is it really bakes in a lot of permanent spending going all the way out to 2026. In fact, by then, uh, the government's going to be spending 30% more permanently than before the pandemic. So this is, a, this is a very expensive budget. There's money for just about everybody in here. Uh, and the one thing it doesn't include is, is an explanation as to how it's all going to be paid for. So a couple points to pick up on there. Um, in terms of spending 30% more, I mean, whenever I hear those kind of numbers, whether it's looking at a company's balance sheet or uh, income statement, in, unless you're kind of generating 30% plus revenues, because obviously you want to have some profit at the end of it, that doesn't even make sense. I mean, you as an individual in your household, you wouldn't spend more, you wouldn't spend 30% more than you make. Um, right. Is that the way we should be looking at the government as well? Yeah, you know, some people debate the importance of having a hard line on balanced budgets, but almost everyone agrees that over the long run or the medium term, you have to balance it out. And we don't see that from this government. Um, they didn't do it before the pandemic, to be fair, and they're not planning on doing it now. But, uh, you know, if they had proposed a budget where revenues were going to be increased in the form of tax hikes, we wouldn't like that. But at least, you know, from an arithmetic standpoint, it would add up. And that's what I think is uh, dangerous about this budget is it's all good news. It's free lunches for everyone, uh, but they really don't want to talk about how those those lunches are eventually going to be paid for. So what do you think? There's so many points to pick up on. Um, what, what do you think is behind the move then? Well, you know, a cynical view is that uh, they have one eye towards an election. Uh, I think it's even fair to say when they started crafting this budget, um, they were thinking about having an election this spring. Of course, then we had the third wave come, and I think that has been put on the back burner now. But this is more of an election platform than a budget, to be honest. Uh, it has a lot of goodies for a lot of people. It seems to want to maximize the immediate impact of measures. So there are not a lot of things uh, that are being pledged to be spent on here that are sort of long-term. They're things that sound really good right now for a lot of people or very soon. Um, and that's why I think this, this, this budget is more about electoral fortunes than it is uh, about actually the, the nuts and bolts of, of running the economy. So like what, what's an example or what are some of the examples if it's everybody's kind of getting a nice free lunch, um, like what? Yeah, the date, the childcare one is the centerpiece of this budget. It's a big ticket item, you know, $30 billion over five years. Sounds like a lot of money, uh, but then you look at how much they're going to pay in debt interest over five years. It's $153 billion, so five times more. Uh, they don't want to talk about that. Um, so, but the daycare, you know, there are a lot of folks that agree right now. Obviously, it's very expensive. I have three kids myself. I know it's very expensive to pay for daycare. Um, but these plans are not going to materialize at best for a couple of years. Uh, they also don't mention that the provinces are going to have to pick up part of the tab and the provinces are in a lot deeper fiscal trouble than the federal government. So in effect, what you have is the federal government promising money uh, that the provinces have to match when the provinces really don't have that money to spare. So it could actually be egging them on to spend money that they really shouldn't be spending. Hmm. Um, when we think then about where we will be, um, so it looks as though it will be about $1.4 trillion dollars. Uh, in terms of the net debt, the interest payments look to be about, I, well, I'm, I'll stand 
stand down on that one. Um, uh, you know, we were at $20 billion as a deficit, I think, when this government came into power or within the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like it's going to be $350 billion. So just from your perspective, kind of tell us where we were and where we are now. Yeah, I mean, this government obviously was elected originally on a platform for, for small deficits for three years and then balancing the budget. They didn't do that. Uh, in fact, they ended up adding about $100 billion uh, more in debt than they had ran on. That was before the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic uh, caused all everything to go out the window. And to be fair, you know, the deficit will drop substantially within a year or two if the temporary spending is cut off. And that's the key. So that's the good news. The bad news is even after that, we're still going to have what's essentially a structural deficit that's larger than before the pandemic. And rather than address that, I mean, the government has really made no effort whatsoever to find savings anywhere in government, in any program, even stuff unrelated to COVID. Uh, and instead, they've larded it up with more than $100 billion in additional spending in the coming years. So this is, um, you know, this is a budget that it, 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 I don't think intuitively makes sense to people. For most people, when you borrow a whole bunch of money that you didn't plan on borrowing, the next move isn't to start thinking about what you can spend on. It's to, well, what can I cut back on to get myself uh, back to balance? And, and the key is that the amount of spending that they have put through or want to put through in this budget um, is really not pandemic related. I think that's one of the key aspects of this, which I don't think really makes sense to a lot of people because, I, I, you know, I think around the world, people would give their governments a pass from a monetary policy spending perspective. Um, as, as well as a fiscal policy perspective to spend, to, to make sure there's liquidity in the mm -hmm. system, make sure there's money and therefore money printing. But what people often forget is that, you know, that, that's why your currency gets devalued. Um, your purchasing power decreases, you know, own cryptocurrencies, I think should be the key takeaway uh, for a lot of people on the back of this. But, um, but, you know, talk to us a little bit, Aaron, about, you know, almost the disconnect. This isn't pandemic related. Yeah, I mean, a perfect example is the daycare program again, right? Uh, the, in 2019, in their last budget, there was no talk of daycare. And in fact, back then, the idea was, well, the deficit is $20 billion. We don't have money for a big ticket item right now. And you fast forward to today, the deficit's $354 billion instead of $20 billion. And now all of a sudden, they're talking as if we simply can't pass up this opportunity to spend this additional $30 billion. I think that's very counterintuitive to a lot of people. Um, right after a you know negative crisis that you didn't anticipate, it's not the time to start thinking about splashing out on stuff that you couldn't even afford before you piled up all that additional debt. At, at the same time, too, though, you know, Christian Freeland does make the point that the pandemic has hurt women, and that having affordable daycare allows women to really be in the workforce, get back in the workforce, and, and perhaps not worry about the cost. So I, I think that that's something that a lot of families do contemplate, right? Mm -hmm. If if the daycare basically is equal to the amount of money that a woman earns after tax, mm -hmm. um, why work? I think that that's, you know, I, I think that I can mm -hmm. understand why this needs to happen. Now, whether or not it's the government programs that should be running it, I, I doubt it. Um, you know, you think that it should be a private public enterprise of some sort, or at least incentivize corporations Mm -hmm. um, to somehow supplement daycare. I mean, I know that that's not necessarily their job, but if they really want to increase the amount of women in, in the workforce, that might be an idea for some, especially mm -hmm. when you see the rollout of the vaccines. Now, now we're trusting the government is going to be able to roll out a national daycare program of some sort. Well, that's exactly the concern. You're absolutely right that, that you know, support for childcare and supporting families with the cost of raising children is a legitimate public policy goal. I'm not disputing that, and I'm not suggesting the government should spend no money on it. What I think is misleading about this plan, one is that it's not going to have the immediate effect. If the concern is that women can't get back into the workforce after COVID, this, none of this is going to kick in for 18 months to two years. So that it doesn't address that. The other thing is whether or not we're going to spend a whole bunch of money on it is a uh, government daycare that's essentially one size fits all the best approach. There are other approaches. You can have a voucher system. You can have direct cash transfers to families, which is what the government has already done to a large extent. And, and it's been very successful. So it's not so much about whether you spend. It's the shape of the spending and whether we're getting the best, you know, giving people the most flexibility and choice for the amount of money that we're spending. The other aspect, of course, that's so important when you think about a budget is the uh, long-term economic growth plan. And if you take a look at what's going on south of the border, 
in the United States, of course, their fiscal stimulus plan really does seem to focus a lot on plans for growth, um, mm -hmm. plans for infrastructure, physical infrastructure, uh, productivity. And, um, you know, is that lacking in this budget? Yeah, look, they certainly pay some lip service to it, but I didn't see a lot in, in the way of specific initiatives. There's some money from research, which will probably help. But you're absolutely right. The, the long-term ticket out of these deficits, if we're going to avoid large tax hikes, is going to have to be growth and productivity. And unfortunately, the challenge politically is that things like growth and productivity, um, they are at odds with the, the need for politicians to have something big and physical they can put in the window to tell people what they're getting. Because you know productivity and growth are essential, uh, but they're hard to translate in language to you know voters that they can understand how they're getting something right away. And I think that's why governments are attracted to sort of shiny things that they can put in the window today rather than stuff that might be more boring sounding, but is actually more important in the long run. Yeah, more important long term, but also I think individuals have to realize it's actually more beneficial to their own household uh, net net worth. Um, if in fact, you know, you don't want the handouts, you really want to be able to have incentives and, and be productive and therefore really kind of take more home for, for your own family. But uh, it doesn't seem as though we're, we're kind of on that same page. I guess one other thing that, you know, when you think about the United States versus Canada right now, and, and you know, Aaron, all of this matters because, you know, you want to have a competitive landscape for corporations to desire to be in your geography, to create jobs. Um, when you look at the United States in terms of what, what they're doing as well, I mean, they're, they've got this more um, US focus and making sure that they've got, uh, you know, enough uh, protection for various items. Um, we obviously saw that with the, the lack of vaccine manufacturing in Canada, but also of course, just personal protective gear. We didn't have mm -hmm. that. That was at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, do we see anything in this budget in terms of a focus with respect to made in Canada? Yeah, there was, a, I mean, there again, some lip service to it. We're going to see how that manifests itself in hard policy. I think on the vaccines in particular, uh, look, I agree that Canada has, has not looked uh, very carefully in the past at some of its strategic industries that it needs to worry about or where it has, it has more to do with, um, again, the political value rather than something um, you know, essential like, like medicine, like vaccines. The reality, Catherine, is that the, the, the investment in regulatory climate in Canada has just been toxic for pharmaceutical companies. It's not been an attractive place to invest in. And that's the reason that we didn't have a lot of that manufacturing capacity. Now, going forward, I think the challenge for Canada is we are obviously a trading nation. We uh, you know, are not an island unto ourselves. We, we have to trade to grow and, and, and generate wealth. Um, but obviously there are concerns around certain industries. So we're going to have to strike that balance between being a trading country, but still finding ways to ensure that we have the capacity to, to, to you know, build certain things in this country that uh, you, we, so we can rely on ourselves if we're not able to rely on any of our trading partners. And, and just to go back for one second, I didn't know that. Why was Canada not an attractive place for pharmaceutical companies to invest and develop products and manufacturing? My goodness. Well, I mean, if you look at our drug policy, for example, uh, you know, there's a lot of costs to developing drugs. And this is, again, talking before uh, COVID ever hit, uh, billions of dollars. Uh, and that's why a lot of these drugs are expensive. But a lot of countries get a lot of political mileage out of saying, well, we're going to limit the price of drugs in this country. So in effect, Canadian uh, Canadians get cheap drugs and Americans and people in other countries have to pay more for their drugs. And we're laughing all the way, but the problem is then the drug makers say, well, I'm not going to develop the drug, make the drugs in your country. And we can see how the chickens have come home to roost now. Uh, you know, drug makers don't want to set up operations in Canada because they, you know, big pharma has been used as a whipping boy in this country for a long time. And unless that changes, I don't really see how you're going to induce them to, to come set up shop here. And we may end up with that nightmare you described earlier, which is a government run uh, pharmaceutical, which sort of uh, sends a shiver down my spine in terms of its ability to get stuff done. Mm. Um, in terms of the um, the budget and and the growing debt deficit levels, uh, there's an important assumption that you have to make as well that obviously Finance Minister Christopher Freeland is making in the in these decisions, which is the interest rate outlook. Because of course, you know you can't just say we're going to spend and print money. You got to pay the interest on that. Um, how much risk is there that she's using too low of an interest rate? 
I think there's considerable risk uh, for the simple reason that we're already at historic rock bottom lows and there's nowhere to go but up. There's no chance that they're going to be lower. We're already seeing some, seeing some upward pressure on rates. I mean, there's questions about what's going to happen with the housing market. Um, if this stimulus leads to the economy overheating, it's going to put the central bank in an awkward position. So I think there is considerable uh, risk of the interest rate rising. And if it does, um, it's going to blow all their numbers out of the, the water here because everything is premised on two things. They're going to control spending going forward, which if you look at their past five years, is, is not a safe assumption. And uh, that interest rates are going to stay low. And yes, they're locking into some long-term bonds, so that will protect for some of the new purchases, but they have to roll over existing debt. And if interest rates are higher, that just means the, the cost of that, refinancing that debt is going to be very high. Now, in terms of all the spending, Aaron, there wasn't necessarily, you know, a wealth tax per se, but they are increasing taxes in a, in a few areas, um, luxury vehicles, uh, tobacco, vaping, and also digital services. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you think of each of those areas that they're targeting? Yeah, you know, the Prime Minister and Finance Minister had telegraphed since last year that there were going to be no tax hikes. There aren't quite no tax hikes, but it's fair to say there's no big broad based tax hikes, no income tax hikes, business tax, capital gains. Uh, but they have found a few sort of niche things. Tobacco taxes are going up. There's a vaping tax. Uh, they're going to charge GST on your Netflix, which I, I don't think anyone is, is surprised about. Uh, the luxury tax uh, on things like uh, your luxury cars and yachts. I find a little bit strange. Uh, it's obviously not going to generate a lot of revenue, just for the simple matter, there's not a lot of people buying yachts. Uh, it seems more designed to signal that they're out to sort of get anyone who's doing well right now. So I think it's uh, a bit of a cynical move. You know, there's no realistic prospect of, of, you know, hitting up yacht owners to pay for all the spending that they're laying out. It's more sort of a signal, uh, again, to, to voters in the future that, you know, what we're, we're going to go get those people who are well off enough to buy a yacht. So it's interesting because some will say that they're destroying incentives for people who really want to have, you know, high quality, high paying jobs, uh, create companies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. if, you know, you're going to work, you know, for 30 years and then the, the you know, you, you're going to be, a, you know, targeted or some people say it's a, it's attacked in a certain way. Um, you know, and I think that um, a lot of people, you know, will probably move. Um, how much of a risk is that, do you think? Well, I think there's always risk with that, whether it's rhetoric, whether it's policy making. this assumption that you can just dump all over the rich. And look, I, I'm the first one to admit that they're not the most sympathetic demographic. I mean, if you're worth millions of dollars while other people are struggling to just pay their rent, it's, it's hard to make the political case that these people need defending. But the reality is the rich in this country pay an overwhelming a share of the tax load. And so for that reason alone, you need to be sensitive to attacking them, because if even a few of them leave, you're left with a huge hole in your revenue that guess what? Everybody else has to make up the difference for. So I think there needs to be some recognition. I'm not saying you have to lose sleep over the guy who's buying a second yacht, but if, you, if you're constantly beating up on him, you can't really blame him if he wants to pick up and, and move somewhere where maybe he's not being made out to be the villain all the time. And I always wonder if those people do leave Canada, um, who does pick up the slack? You know, when the government realizes that they've got a huge hole because that revenue is not coming in, I would think that they're going to start raising the tax rate on more middle income earners. You know, it's not going to be a free ride. Yeah, and that's exactly what happens. I mean, we did a study a couple of years ago that looked at the tax rates across, of Can across Canada by province. And lo and behold, if you look at a province like Alberta, where there's a higher share of wealthy individuals, they pay far more of all the tax. And if you go to provinces where there's far fewer wealthy individuals, like many of the Atlantic provinces, guess who's paying more of the tax load? It's middle class people. So in other words, you want to have rich people around because they pay a lot of tax and it means that everybody else can pay less. So there, there is a real advantage to having them there. Interesting. Um, Aaron, I'm, I also, I, 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 we should ask about the carbon tax. What's the latest mm -hmm. there in terms of carbon tax in this budget? Yeah, they're a sort of full steam ahead on the carbon tax. Uh, they have a second carbon tax as well in the form of a clean fuel standard. So, you know, they are sort of tightening the vice around anyone uh, who's using any, you know, anything, doing any activity or any occupation that involves uh, carbon emissions. You know, obviously climate change uh, fighters love this, but there's real consequences for our competitiveness. Um, you know, there's no getting around it. These things are a cost. 
And if Canada can't be competitive cost-wise, it's going to cost us jobs. It's going to cost us economic activity. And uh, that's that's bad news at a time, especially parts of the country like uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan that are that are struggling right now. And Aaron, I never quite get this, but whenever you know we say it's a, a cost or a tax, and I've interviewed some of the ministers on this, yeah. um, they say no, it's not because the individual gets it back. I I I, I, I always find that. <laughs> Well, we're seeing this with Aaron O'Toole yeah. now with his sort of loyalty points plan. Uh, there are a lot of people that get stuck in the semantics over it's a tax or a levy or it's a fee, but I think it's pretty simple to most people. It's a tax if it's your money, the government is taking it and you can't spend it on what you want to spend it on. It doesn't really matter if they send it back to you in the form of a government program or uh, you know uh, a special rebate through it. It's still a tax because you're deprived of that money. So people can do backflips all day about you know the semantics of it, but it is a cost. It costs people money, and they don't have that money to use on whatever else they wanted to spend it on. It, the way you just described it, it almost reminds me of um, you know if you go and you spend your Canadian currency at a Canadian tire and you get back Canadian tire money. Um, that that's almost like the, the format you're describing. You, you you have this carbon tax, but maybe you get it back in some kind of program. Doesn't quite well, yeah, fit. Yeah, that, and that's Aaron O'Toole's plan. Look, I understand he's trying to come up with something to compete with Justin Trudeau, but at least with Trudeau's plan, you know, you pay the tax, you get it back at tax time or part of it back, but it's cash, right? You can spend it on whatever you want. With Aaron O'Toole, he's saying, no, it's going to go into a special bank account. They're going to be basically Aaron O'Toole bucks, and we're going to have a, a government drawn up list of things that you can spend it on that are green. I don't think a lot of people, given the choice between cash and points, are going to pick the points, especially when it's the government drawing up the list of the things that you can buy. Wow. Um, you know, Aaron, we'll, we'll wrap it here. Um, but I guess, you know, in, in terms of... Um, Canadians hopefully listening to this um you know I think when you say let's talk about the budget a lot of people their eyes will glaze over it doesn't matter to me it's just numbers I can't listen to it um you know hopefully that's not the case for a lot of people I'm trying to encourage people to really kind of listen and pay attention because I think it affects everybody all of these decisions and these policy decisions but so what would you say to that to those people who might you know get glazed over a bit Hopefully they're not after this conversation, yeah. um, but, but at the, I should have almost started with this question. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm a little more optimistic than usual, actually. I mean, for two reasons. One is we, there was a survey last week that showed, you know, 82 percent of Canadians want to see uh, political parties present a plan for a balanced budget. That, sh that tells me that they understand just intuitively that when you spend, eventually someone has to pay for it. And I think that's a very healthy thing. If 82 percent, that's almost everybody. So people just understand intuitively if you spend a dollar, you have to figure out where that's coming from. And, and I think that's important because that's how you hold politicians to account. They love to promise free things, but if you ask the question, okay, that's great, but how are you gonna pay for it? I, that's an important part of the, the democratic process. The other thing I'd say is because of the pandemic, because so many people have been impacted and it has turned the world upside down, for the first time maybe in our lives, the idea of borrowing money to survive is, is real to people. It's not something that the government did over there that didn't affect me. People lost their jobs, people had to stay home, businesses went under. We understand that we had to borrow a whole bunch of money. And so I, I, I do believe that people, again, intuitively understand that we, we had to borrow because we had to survive, but we have to pay this back. We have to sort of claw our way back. And so I'm hoping that that sort of informs the way uh, political debates uh, change going forward. Do you think more people are engaged now then? It, it almost sounds as though they are, especially with that 82% number. Yeah, I think so, if only because people are sitting at home and they have less to do. So there's been a lot more engagement on social media. People are watching uh, things like your show, right? I mean, people want to find things to do with the, the time that they have. And so if there is any silver linings to this terrible situation, you know, one of them might be that the people are thinking a lot more about these big questions. That's a great silver lining. We will leave it there. Uh, Aaron, great to get your perspective today. As always, I, I love reading all the research that you and your team do across Canada. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.